Hello. I'm very glad to be here with you, virtually, of course. I wish I could be there in person, but I can't. So I'm hoping that this will be able to inspire you. I want to start by something uh, that, that's really related to my own experience. One of the big challenges I've had working for the last 30 years as a futurist is to think about different ways for us to liberate our imagination. How do we push our thinking? Now, one way to push our thinking is extrapolation. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, you have a telephone, uh, it's big, uh, and you extrapolate it, becoming smaller and more powerful. Uh, you have a car, you extrapolate, it goes faster. You're Jules Verne, you imagine a cannon that can shoot somebody to the moon. You extrapolate. You take what you already know and you make it bigger, better, faster, whatever. Uh, this is what we traditionally do because it's what we know. The challenge that I've been struggling with and it's still something that's not entirely worked out, but we're, we're, we're trying and testing different ways, is reframing. But reframing in what way? Well, you can reframe by changing the variables, and then you just dial them up and down. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, you change the variable, let's say, from making schools better to eliminating schools and doing learning. Or you change transportation from you know, something that's meant to get you to work but now it's not about getting people to work because they work at home, so transportation's about something else. You change the variable. But there is another way of reframing, and that's to move the way we imagine the future out of the traditional perspective, to take a different approach to imagining the future. Not probable, not desirable, and kind of utopian. In other words, can we think about the future in a way that doesn't relate to our typical understanding of its utility. The future is useful because we want to get there. <laughs> we want to get there either to plan it or to make it better or whatever, but we want to get there. But what about if we abandon that premise? If we abandon the premise that the future is something we want to get to, and instead we try and imagine futures without paying attention to probability or desirability. That's reframing based on a change in the way we think about the future. And that's what this exercise is about. Now, that doesn't mean that we can dispense with the analytical components of describing anything. You need variables to describe something, whether it's the cup in front of you or an imaginary future. So I'm going to provide you, in the context of the learning intensive society, with some variables, with some uh, key pieces of the puzzle for describing an imaginary world, but I'm not paying any attention, I'm not caring about whether it's probable, desirable, or something that we should plan. What I'm trying to do is to give you a place to, to kind of play in where the parameters, the variables, are different. And so the Learning Intensive Society is composed of these four quadrants, the traditional ones. In that sense, it's, it's an extrapolation. Technology, economy, society, and governance. And it's an attempt to really rethink some aspects of it without being worried or constrained by, oh, but that's not realistic. You shouldn't think about that. It can't be done. Uh, or, you know, I don't really like that, so I don't want to do it, so let's not think about that. This is not that kind of exercise. This is an exercise where we're really encouraged to play and to go beyond what we think is reasonable, likely, probable, planable, desirable, governable, but rather to invent a world that we've not seen before. In the case of the Learning Intensive Society, the key transformation has to do with unique creation. Unique creation, think about it for a moment. Something that's not mass-produced, something that is not sourced from a mass-production approach to the world. It's unique. What happens with unique creation? Well, unique creation actually draws on a critical resource and that resource is you. Meaning there's no way to create something unique if you haven't played a role in inventing it, in imagining it. So this is a world where Steve Jobs and the mass production Model T cars don't have much place. Rather it's a world of unique creation. But in order for unique creation to be effective, to be workable, it's critical to be able to invent to know thyself, to say, who am I? What's my identity? And to make decisions. Creating a world around us 
by inventing the relationships, the attributes of daily life, has huge potential because there's so many things to do. It's not like this is a world where we don't have stuff that needs to be done. Taking care of each other, finding meaning, enjoying the world, creating things, producing value, exchanging, sharing, learning. In the learning intensive society, the critical ingredient for the economy, for identity, for governance is learning. Learning becomes what today GNP is for the industrial economy. We're so accustomed to thinking of industrial society. We're so accustomed to searching for scale, reproducibility, norms, standards. The learning soci intensive society, uh, which involves this uh, search for a learning-based value creation system can be described using a possibility space. The possibility space has on one axis mass production and unique creation. On the other, it's got the learning intensity of the activity. In other words, do we accept what somebody tells us, the boss, the consumer, or do we actually have to invent it ourselves? And if we move up this axis, which is not deterministic and not probable or desirable, we nevertheless see a difference between different situations. In the context of mass production, which is at the lower left, you have relatively low uh, learning intensity, intensity and you have mass production organization of production. If you go up to the top, the upper right, you have learning, creativity, but this is not the artist, the genius artist. This is the banal creativity of everybody. There's nobody in this room, I can make a bet even though I'm not there, that's wearing the same clothes. We're not wearing a uniform. We invent who we are. We express who we are. That's a process of learning and a process of self-definition and something that's continuously ongoing. And so this is what the learning intensive society is about. It's about creating value through the refinement of your own taste. Notice, taste, preference, what you like, what makes you happy, is not determined by a technocratic hierarchy. There's not a sort of a better or worse in the way it's who you are. It's a question of maturation, of developing and refining through experience who you are, what you are, what your community is about. And that puts learning in a really pivotal position because it allows us, and I'll move on to the slide about the uh, kind of social context, identity, is that you can see in the, in the possibility space related to identity that the challenge is to kind of search for meaning and to do so continuously. And in that context, we have homogeneous and scale on one side and choice on the other. So what happens in this context? Well, in mass society, you have this homogeneous kind of massified, standardized society. In the learning intensive society, to describe it, you have heterogeneous and small, fluid, what Zygmunt Bauman called the liquid society. And then when it comes to decision making, you're confronted constantly in this society with the reality of our freedom in the sense of sen, meaning it's not just getting out of prison that counts, the oppression of starvation, the oppression of authoritarianism, but the question becomes, how do I make the choice of what kind of father to be, what kind of friend to be, what kind of citizen to be? In other words, I'm constantly being called upon to make decisions about who I am, what I'm going to do, how I'm going to do it. That makes learning constant. It makes it more intensive. And the question is how to sustain it. Well, Today, and it's often a reaction that people have, is that there's already too much choice. Don't give me more choice. I don't want more choice. But the question becomes, what's our capability? And here it's a question of capacity and development of our ability to think about different things. Today already, everybody, I mean, I can make the assumption, knows that there's lots of different foods you can choose. You can go to Korean, Chinese, uh, Japanese, Indian, uh, European, American, etc. You have all this choice. And we nevertheless, we, we navigate it. Over time, we learn to navigate these choices. But we need to develop the capability. And here we're reaching at something that's really critical because it's a fundamental shift and transformation on par with the kind of change that happened when peasants moved to the city. They weren't able to read. They weren't able to write. They didn't know what it meant to show up on time or to listen to the boss. Those were all things that they were unfamiliar with.
But through schooling and many years of transition, the Industrial Society created this cap capability, which is reading and writing, and all the norms that are attached to Industrial Society that allow Industrial Society to function. The challenge here is to imagine a learning intensive society. What are the norms? What are the underlying characteristics that make a learning intensive society where you're constantly defining who you are workable, doable? We need to think about those capabilities. We can't just expect it to be magic in the same way we can't expect a peasant to adapt magically to industrial society. It takes institutions, processes, it takes supporting structures, it takes norms that allow us to be transparent and open. So that leads me to the governance issue. And in governance, there's this question of decision-making capacity. And decision-making capacity is one of these really kind of difficult to figure out things. Because there's no way to know if you made the right decision. Because, of course, if you made the decision to go on the right fork, you didn't go on the left fork. So there's no way to know, actually, if the left fork was better than the right fork. So there's always something about decision-making that's left unknowable. Because you didn't take the other decision. But in theory, and this is a framing a set of assumptions, if you do more decision making, if you practice, if you have more access to information, if information is more transparent and you become more experienced, presumably you get a little bit better at making decisions that you think make sense. So the governance side of this has to do very much with learning. The more we do trial and error, the more we experiment, because experimentation is the great way to learn, the more we experiment, the more we get better at decision making. And so all of these things go together. And there's a, a graph that I'll put up that, that describes kind of this learning intensive society. It's got these four quadrants. And the four quadrants talk about technological, economic, social, and governance. And you'll see that they're interrelated. Experimentation and reflection are related to autonomy. So those are governance issues that are related to social issues. You have the range of uses, the effectiveness of our tools, of which there are many tools, and I won't, you know, dwell on any particular one because you've been talking about blockchain and AI and all the rest, but it's a, it's a panoply of tools. And the tools are meaningful, powerful in context, in the context which we put them to use. And if we put them to use when we look at the extent of our choices, if we look at the heterogeneity of our societies, if we look at unique creation, the way we use AI, the way we would use blockchain, the way we would use tools, new contracts, new mashups of ideas, uh, and value creation would be different because we would not be looking for scalability. We would not be looking for mass creation. We would production. We would be looking for learning and creativity and the negotiation of shared meaning, the creation of collective action through interaction and experimentation. A very different approach to the engineering deterministic world that we live in today. So. If we think of this shift from a mass era to a learning intensive society, what are some of the like big changes that are not, you know, the things that wouldn't be the same? Let me take three. The first one is that the number of university graduates does not improve anything in the learning intensive society. Why? Universities are dedicated to technocratic knowledge. They're dedicated to hierarchical learning. They're dedicated to becoming more and more expert in something. But in the learning intensive society with unique creation and identity and continuous choice of who you are and what kind of community you're in, where that's the value, you need to know thyself. This is about learning. It's about wisdom. And one of the really fascinating things is that up until now, the industrial society really has, has put wisdom on the back, backyard, out the window, really. Con traditional societies often valued wisdom. But industrial society has this curious relationship to wisdom. In fact, we never talk about it. But in this society, the wisdom society, experience, experimentation, and failure are important. So imagine your resume, your CV, without failure. They look at it and they say, hey, it means you haven't done anything. It means you haven't tried. It means you haven't experimented. So you don't really know anything. So there's a really fundamental kind of transformation in the way in which learning is conceived and used in the society, which obviously alters the relationship to education. Think about innovation, okay, the current buzzword. Well, innovation today is about industrial innovation. It's about improving industrial society. It's about improving the way in which things function on the basis of the past. 
But in the context of the learning intensive society, the crucial thing is creativity and self-knowledge, not the innovation of a factory and a gadget. So there's another transformation that's really quite fundamental. And finally, we could think of uh, the question of aging. <laughs> in today's societies, aging is a problem. Aging is a problem because it means pensions will be overburdened. And it, it, basically, it says that when you're older, you're really not worth much to society. Better you should die. What a strange and bizarre concept. But here in the learning intensive society, it's exactly the opposite. As you get older, you get wiser. You become more valuable. You become more efficient. So if we make a little ceteris paribus assumption that through experience you become more effective, then in the learning intensive society, the wealthiest societies are the oldest societies, not the youngest societies. But I'm just playing with the different ways in which a learning intensive society might function. Your task in this reframing exercise is to put yourself in that world. Don't worry about how we got there. Don't worry if it's probable. Don't worry about whether or not it's desirable or not desirable. That's not the issue. The challenge here is to find a way to describe how things function day in the life in this strange learning intensive society. I hope that that gives you enough to play with and it's meant to be playful. You should have fun. That helps with the creativity. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing about the results and uh, to being in touch uh, soon. Thank you.